Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our second family day. Uh, for the first time, the Epilepsy Foundation is able to join in and host uh, family day because we are newly merged with the Epilepsy Therapy Project. And the first family day was hosted by the Epilepsy Therapy Project as part of the Pipeline Conference. And for some of you, you may have been part of the Pipeline Conference over the past couple of days, where innovators, venture capitalists, industry representatives, family members, and community partners participated together to think about and discuss and strategize about how we can accelerate therapies in a, in a way that would make a meaningful difference for people living with epilepsy. And it was a very exciting couple of days. And today, we have the chance to celebrate together and think about what we can do as a community to continue that acceleration so that we can dare to live meaningful lives and help others live meaningful lives with epilepsy. And my name is Phil Gatone. I'm president and CEO of the Epilepsy Foundation. And first and foremost, I am, <laughs> I am, a, uh, a father of a 27-year-old son with epilepsy. And to my left <laughs> is, <laughs> that's all right, I'm sure it'll work. Uh, they were gonna move a slide. Now we're good. Uh, there we go. Uh, thank you, Patty. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I am the father of a 27-year-old son who lives with epilepsy. And um, so this is very meaningful for me as a father, not just as an advocate uh, alongside of all of you. I want to say a thank you to some people for making this, uh, this conference happen. Uh, we have some sponsors that will be thanked a little later in the morning, but uh, Catherine Keeney is the executive director of the Epilepsy Foundation of Northern California, and I want to thank Catherine and her board of directors for their support of this event. And uh, what you may not realize is that probably by the time I'm done talking and the time we get into our, our agenda for the day, this room will be full. We have um, uh, over 400 people registered for this meeting. So uh, as people come in, uh, please wave if you have a seat available next to you because it's going to be a full room in just a little bit. But I do want to say that Catherine has been instrumental. Her, her board has been very instrumental. Along with the other California affiliates, we have an affiliate in uh, Greater Los Angeles and in San Diego County, Susan Peach Esqueda and Kathy West have been great partners and great leaders right here in the great state of California. And some of you have traveled well beyond California to be here, and I, I really appreciate that as well. I'd like to recognize our chair of the Epilepsy Foundation Board of Directors, Warren Lammert, who's here to my left. Warren is the founder of the Epilepsy Therapy Project and the co-founder of epilepsy.com. I might have that reversed, but Orin, Dr. Orrin Davinsky and Warren really came forward to make a difference uh, by bringing an incredible idea forward, which is maybe there's another way to help. Maybe there's another way outside of the traditional mechanisms that exist that can help and maybe even support those traditional mechanisms. And so he started the Epilepsy Therapy Project and has led a decade of funding support along with the Epilepsy Foundation, 60 of the 120 drugs, devices, and therapeutics to help people living with epilepsy. So I'm really thankful for Warren's vision and his leadership, along with other members in this room who are members of our board of directors. Uh, Warren, thank you so much for, for all you've done to make this a, a really wonderful partnership. <laughs> awareness, awareness, awareness. What is the one thing that we as family members feel needs to be better in epilepsy? Awareness. Well, I have the privilege of serving in this role 
as CEO, so I get to do something about that. But I will not be able to do something about that without your help. We are going to raise awareness of epilepsy in a way that it has never been done before. We, for the first time, have a friend on television. Uh, he owns a shop in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's a pawn shop. And people come into his store and have items that they want him to buy from them. <laughs> and his name is Rick Harrison. Rick has had epilepsy since he's been eight years old. And Rick has agreed to help us raise awareness of epilepsy. And he has uh, just completed shooting a public service announcement that will be played all around the country on all of the A&E network stations that can help people with epilepsy in the community understand that there are services and people available to help. So uh, that's going to be happening. We're going to launch that uh, right around Epilepsy Awareness Month in November. So uh, watch for that, and, and you can help, uh, help raise awareness as well in your own community. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Education. With epilepsy.com, our education and digital platform is stronger than it's ever been. We have a half a million people come to our website every month, and we are going to be able to provide education in a way that it has never been provided before. So I hope and encourage all of you will go to epilepsy.com to check it out. It's new and it will work on your smartphone as well as uh, your laptops and your uh, iPads and your desktops. So um, we're really excited about the new digital platform that we're going to be able to provide. When it comes to services in your local community, we're going to build out connectivity so that, so that you can build a community both digitally and geographically, that's meaningful to you. And we're going to do that in a way that's going to ask for your involvement and participation. And uh, so be watching for that this summer. You'll see on epilepsy.com how you can participate in your community to help bring services, raise awareness, advocate uh, for epilepsy. And then um, lastly, I just want to tell you that this is extremely personal to all of us, I think, because... Epilepsy affects everybody uh, in your family. It doesn't just affect the person with epilepsy, it affects the whole family. And so uh, for us, Philip was four years old when we had uh, found him in his bedroom having a seizure. Um, he has had thousands of seizures and has had two brain surgeries for his epilepsy. He is uh, one of the fortunate individuals who, after surgery and further treatment, has uh, gone from needing an aid in the classroom to being a rather independent and living on his own now, uh, married and employed and uh, smarter than me and stronger than me and better than me in every way. And uh, we're proud of him, but we do know uh, my wife, Jill, who went on to become an epilepsy nurse uh, for 10 years in Chicago, we know that our families, families in this room, uh, do everything right. You find the good care, you find the best care you can for yourselves and your loved ones. Doctors are doing everything right. They're using the very best treatments available. And you have all the support you need, ideally, and still epilepsy persists. Still epilepsy impacts our lives. Still epilepsy takes lives. Why is that when you're doing everything you can? It's because epilepsy is insidious. Epilepsy affects anybody at any age. So it's up to us to continue that fight together to see what we can do to put an end to this and provide um, opportunities for people to dare to live their lives and live their dreams. So today, we're going to share how we can help each other become more well-equipped with good information about epilepsy and ideas that we can take with us back home into our communities so we can strengthen ourselves and our communities. And there are so many people involved in preparing this day, but uh, there's a person who really took the lead and organized this and her name is Patty Schaefer. And Patty uh, has served in key national roles uh, in addition to her day job as a nurse out in Boston. She ha Patty has served as the chair of our professional advisory board. Patty has served in just about every capacity you can serve in epilepsy. I was talking to a colleague of hers just before I came up. Uh, who is highly respected, won our National Volunteer of the Year Award, Pat Dean, out of Florida. And Pat said, 
Patty is the hardest working person in epilepsy. <laughs> and, and I don't disagree. Patty, it's an honor to work with you, and thank you for all you've done to put this conference together. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, help me join, join me in welcoming Patty Schaefer. Thank you, Phil. One thing I'm not is tall, so uh, I need to turn a little bit to see. So uh, we want to get us rolling, but we do have a little bit of uh, uh, set the stage. First, a lot you're going to hear a lot today. Uh, we had two days of a uh, pipeline. Really, we're, well, you're going to hear what that pipeline is. But really what we're talking about is some of the new therapies and what does that mean for each and every one of us for, for um, with kind of three key words, I hope that people will, will have resonate with them. That sense of empowerment, that you can get some power out of this conference to take home with you, to feel some hope in your journey with epilepsy and to find the right help that you need. Uh, here are a uh, few of our sponsors that we really want to, to thank, Synovian and Isai, um, uh, and I can't even see, UCB. <laughs> so thank you very much. We'll uh, be having these throughout the day. Um, the goals of this conference, as I said, is to become empowered. I can't empower anyone else. No one can give you power. It's your job to do that, whether it's as an individual, becoming an active part of your healthcare team, working towards the best control of seizures that you can, to learn more about new therapies, but also to understand the importance of research, what it can mean for you, what you can do for research in the broader sense, and what it can mean for your communities. Okay? There's a few housekeeping items. If any of you have devices available, iPads, iPhones, or so on, or tablets, you can access this all the presentations and the slides through an app. You can go through iTunes, plug in Epilepsy Pipeline, and you can download that. If it's through an Android, I think if you just write in Epilepsy Foundation, it can be downloaded. If you need some help in doing that, we do have some instructions right at the registration desk. Once you get um, to actually get the wireless internet, you need to be able to put in an access code, and this is the access code, 166-45-1030, okay? 166 1030 uh, bathrooms, uh, go out here, down to the right, and another right, and we have bathrooms, so we always need to know where those are. Registration desks to the left. You should have had a handout where you could get an agenda for the day. Also, a one-pager with kind of gives you a brief synopsis of some of the talks. Again, the detailed slides you can get online afterwards or through the app, right? We know many of us have seizures, right? Anyone's having problem, turn to your neighbor, ask for help. We have designated first responders, too, so we got plenty of help. If anybody needs it, just raise your hand. We're here, okay? Um, we do have another room uh, for participants that, that we're streaming live in, so th that we may end up using that, and, and when we do, I'll, I'll let you know how to do ask questions. Um, for those of us in our online audience now, uh, you can go to www.epilepsy.com slash pipeline slash, no, dash live dash stream. Now if you're hearing this, you're probably already there, but I'm saying it again because on that page, if you look down the bottom, there's response section. So when we have panel question and answer time, I welcome our internet audience to write in questions there and we'll be forwarding your questions to the speakers and there'll be time for all of you to be asking questions during that time. Okay. Uh, we do have exhibits out here and down to your left. I really encourage people, if you need to take a break, go visit them during our breaks, during lunch. Um, and we are having kind of a, a research presentation during lunch, but it's also a free networking time. Okay, so with that quick <laughs> highlights, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Elson So. He's going to talk with us about the challenges of living with epilepsy. You guys are the experts with it, but we all want to get on the same page in terms of the challenges of epilepsy in general, what that might bring to each and every one of us. Right? Dr. So is the president of the American Epilepsy Society and the professor of the Mayo Medical School. Before I, I invite him up, I kind of went out of my own order of notes, and I, I just wanted to raise a thought here. Um, I have epilepsy. Mine can be controlled, but I al always have to be on medicines. I've got a son who is on the good side. I mean, his seizures went away, he's off medicines, he's a U.S. Marine right now. 
We're, yes, Ura. Hopefully he comes down here sometime today. But we also, we're going to hear from people who have lost someone to epilepsy, who have had horrible times with it or have gone through surgery and come out the other end with a different life experience. Each and every one of you may have these different experiences with that. For many of you, you might feel hopeful. For others of you, what you hear might feel sad or scary or worrisome to you. So I, I, um, epilepsy is, is unique, and it affects us all very differently. So we appreciate how different that can be and how difficult it may or may not be for you. But we're all here together, your neighbors sitting next to you, your speakers, your networking time. So, so reach out to those here if you're hearing things that are bothersome or have questions, and also take that information, too, back to your care team to help get the answers for yourself. And with this, Dr. So, please. Thank you. So there you go. Your turn. Well, th well, thank you very much for this opportunity to participate in this important conference. And I know it's not right to start off the morning by talking about challenges, because the word challenges really suggests something negative. But I, I would like to sort of show you uh, why we have challenges and what we needs to be done, at least. And the subsequent speakers for the rest of the day will address some of these challenges. We have to begin to accept, to know about the challenges, to be able to improve the lives of people with epilepsy and their families. So we're going to talk about the challenges in making the diagnosis in some patients, not in all, and for some doctors. It's not only patients who have challenges, it's the doctors. For some doctors, we're going to talk about the challenges posed by the condition because there are terms like seizures versus epilepsy. It's like disorder. You have heard of the term seizure disorder. We have not used the term seizure disease or epilepsy disease. But there's beginning to be some talk about whether we should use the word disorder or disease. There's also the fact that epilepsy is a spectrum disorder. So that poses a challenge. And of course, we know about, we know about the comorbidities of epilepsy. We also know about the negative impact of epilepsy and the socioeconomic status of the person and the family with the epilepsy. So what happens when a person has a seizure? A person sees the doctor. And you wouldn't be surprised if the doctor, especially if the doctor is a neurologist, asks a lot of probing questions. That's the history. And in fact, I interview the patient separately from the family, the witness. And 30% of the time, I would have to pick up the phone and call the witness or the friend or the fiancé to get the other side of the story. So what happens next is your doctor most likely ordered an EEG, a brain wave test. And what you're looking at, I don't even have to use a pointer to show you. You know where the electrical spark is. It's close to the middle of the page. That's the finding. Often, that's what the doctor is looking for, some evidence from the brain wave that there is an excessive electrical surge. In this country, another test that will be done, of course, is MRI of the brain. In most cases, it can be done, with only very few contraindications. In this particular patient, you can easily see the scar tissue. I, again, I don't have to use my pointer to point it out to you. And the scar tissue is causing the seizure. However, the challenge is this. Only 60% of the first EEG would be, 40% would be positive. 60% is negative. So at least half of the time, your test, EEG or MRI, is going to be negative. This is across the board, from newborns to the elderly, regardless of the cause. This, this is sort of the general sort of yield of EEG and MRI. So the history is so important. 70% of the diagnosis is based on the history. That's what my mentor, Dr. Kiffin Penry, told me. And that's still the case, despite the developments in MRI and so forth and so on. So what is the challenge? Well, the challenge is this. The seizures may not be witnessed. You all know that. The person who had a seizure may not be able to recall how it happened. The first thing they knew, th their eyes open, and the first responders are ready to get them into the stretcher, into the ambulance. The history itself may not be reliable. 
So there are several challenges. So don't blame the first doctor who saw you not making the right diagnosis because I don't make the correct diagnosis in the first visit all the time. Now another challenge is there are many kinds of spells that can mimic seizures. Fainting alone can have jerks. In fact, that's probably one of the more frequent mimickers of seizures. Heart attacks, for example. So when the diagnosis is uncertain, the other problem is it's not a condition where you can say, take an aspirin and call me back tomorrow. <laughs> so it's very, very complex. Now, the other thing is the terms, the names we use. So what do we mean by seizures and what do we mean by epilepsy? And that's often a thing that not only confuses patients and families, but also general practitioners. When we say seizures, we are referring to the episodes of symptoms. The word I prefer to use, but I avoid using, is attacks of symptoms. Attacks is too scary, so I try not to use it, at least not with my patients in front, in my office, in the first few visits. But it's an episode, a spell of symptoms, due to excessive electrical surge of brain electricity. So that implies that normally there is electrical fluctuation in all our brains, that's how we are kept alive. But when there is an excessive surge, what can happen is that when that surge spreads, the person can have symptoms, and the symptoms can range from not being able to speak, jerking of one side, to something as dramatic as a grand mal seizure. So that episode is what we call a seizure. A seizure does not equal epilepsy. Epilepsy is the predilection, the propensity for having the seizures repeatedly, if untreated. And that, the, the second part of the definition is that that propensity is not easily and totally removable. What do I mean by this? If a person had an epileptic seizure, the episode, because of low blood sugar, because that person is diabetic and the diabetes is not well controlled, the amount of insulin does not match with what the patient consumes in, in terms of sugar. So the patient had a very low blood sugar and went into an epileptic seizure. If the diabetes is better controlled, that propensity, that risk is removed. And so that person does not have epilepsy. That person did have an epileptic seizure. So epilepsy is different from epileptic seizure. And again, it's something that even general practitioners often uh, sort of fail to make a distinct distinction. Now, the other thing is that we have this situation where we have to struggle sometimes between seizures and epilepsy, whereas other neurological conditions probably do not. If I had a stroke 2 a.m. this morning, I had a stroke. A year from now, I'll still be telling my friends over wine and dinner that I just had a stroke. I have a conditioned stroke. I had a migraine attack, and I have migraines. I have a family history of migraines. So there's less confusion in using the same terms to indicate the condition and indicate the attacks. The other problem is that you and I know that the condition of, and I hate to use this word, pseudo-seizure, psychogenic spells, it's quite common, quite common. At any time, in any center in the United States and around the world, in fact, because I just spoke with someone from Australia, 30% of the patients in the epilepsy monitoring unit would not have epilepsy. They have psychogenic spells. And the problem is even that particular term endorsed here in our country has the word seizure in it. It's psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. I don't agree with the use of the term, the word seizures for that condition. Even pseudo-seizures is something I, I hate using. So I try to tell my patients, you have spells, you do not have seizures. You have behavioral spells. It doesn't mean to say you have bad behavior, it's not under your control. But I try not to use the word seizures. So here comes the sort of dilemma do we call seizures or epilepsy a disorder or a disease? Some people prefer disease. The reason is because 
disorder sounds a little bit more like mental disorder or disorderly conduct. And this is not me saying, this is some people with the condition saying. We say heart disease, we don't say heart disorder. We know cancer to be a disease, not a disorder. So some people would rather say I have a disease rather than I have a disorder. However, this is not the consensus. We don't know yet. We probably need to survey people. Some people prefer to say disorder because the term disease may be thought of as something incurable or something that can spread, something that is infectious. People with well-controlled seizures may not consider themselves as having a disease. And the term disease is probably a little bit more stigmatizing. We don't know. Now, the other challenge is epilepsy is a spectrum disorder. So let's look at this. There are many types of seizures in epilepsy. You all know that. But the other thing is the biology. In the meaning of biology is the chemistry and the cellular structure behind underpinning each type of seizure or epilepsy is different. You then have different prognosis. You have different treatments. You have different approaches to treating patients according to their age, their gender, their conditions. We shall see. So let's look at the causes of epilepsy. This is an epidemiological study done in the town where I live, Rochester, Minnesota. And you can see that across the board, from age one year to the elderly, majority of the time, 60% of the time, we won't be able to quite pinpoint the cause of epilepsy. Embedded in this, of course, is genetic factors. But here, this would be somewhat representative of the whole country. We, 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 we over the past, this study was done more than 30 years ago. We now have more minority population, but uh, this is, a little bit skewed uh, towards the Caucasian population. It was done a number of years ago, but it's still representative of many places with some changes here in this country. The big causes of epilepsy, if it can be found, would be strokes, something like brain tumor or brain trauma. Now that we know that, the other side of the coin, knowing that, is this other picture. What is this picture showing? Well, these are bars. The farther they are to your right, the higher the risk of developing seizures after sustaining the condition. So you can see that brain tumor, not all, I'm not saying 100% of brain tumor patients will develop seizures, but the score is 40. If you look at severe head trauma, traumatic brain injury, TBI, at the bottom, the score is 29, high risk. Okay, so what I'm saying is not all causes of epilepsy have the same risk profile. Something like encephalitis or, or meningitis has a lower score. The score is only about two or, or five. On top of that, you look at this particular patient of mine, and this is something I got the internet, this, this, this accident was very similar to what my patient sustained, unfortunate accident. And here's the MRI of my patient. It's a little bit dark, but if you can see to your left side is scar tissue. You're looking at Swiss cheese. The brain, unfortunately, on that side has been damaged tremendously. If you look at the other side of the brain, it's also been damaged, fortunately not as bad. But guess what? This patient of mine does not have epilepsy. Why? I don't understand. Maybe. Another 10 years from now, we'll discover that patients like these, they have a particular chemical in their brain that protects them, despite the fact that they have a bad MRI. So we don't understand yet. I'll have to tell you the story about this patient. It was in a medical journal. So this is a 27-year-old patient who had a first seizure in his lifetime. He went to the emergency room, and his doctor, rightly so, took a history but before taking the EEG, decided to get an MRI, the right thing to do. It was an acute seizure, seizure out of the blue for the first time. When the MRI machine was turned on, the patient started screaming. You all know why, right? Because when the doctors did the skull x-ray, they found a big nail 
in the patient's head. So doctors went to the patient and said, hey, you got a big nail in your head. <laughs> the, so the patient said, what are you talking about? The doctor said, look at the x-ray. The patient, I don't know how it got there. Are you sure it's my x-ray? The patient thought about it a little while. I said, oh, when I was five, I was playing with my older brother with a powered hand gun that would shoot nails. We had a shot. We didn't know where the nail went. So you tell me, and by the way, the, the doctors, of course, had to pull out the nail, big surgery, and then did an MRI. What you are seeing on the other side of the picture is big damage. The whole temporal lobe is damaged. Now you have to tell me why it took 22 years for this gentleman to develop his first seizure. What is protecting him from doing that? We don't know. That's a challenge of epilepsy. We do know after a serious head injuries, if the patient is going to develop seizures, it's gonna happen in the first few years of life, but that's in no way absolute. It can take a long time before the first seizure occurs. I'm showing you this EEG, and the reason is because if I were taking an examination and I'm showing this EEG, I'm supposed to give the diagnosis even without reading the history. And why sits so this condition called infantile spasms? West syndrome, which I know some of you are familiar with because you have children who have this condition. Why is it that they have this EEG that you don't find in adults, for example? We don't know. Why is it that people, mostly adults, but children too, but mostly adults, you say emerging condition, which we call autoimmune epilepsy, antibodies in the body, in our bodies that attack ourselves, our brain cells, why is it they have this EEG with, with all this, this, as if someone's sketching on top of you know, the EEG lines? Why is it they have that? We, we don't understand. So there are still a lot of things in the biology of epilepsy we don't understand. In older people, the way they absorb medication, the way they metabolize, break down the medicines, is very different from other people. In pregnancy, you've heard about this already. We have to be careful about the kind of medication we use because we know it can affect the fetus, the baby. The way that the pregnant woman metabolizes the medication is very different. So it's a whole spectrum. So we have many types of epilepsy. The biology treatment prognosis is different. Some people don't develop seizures at all despite the, for the same or even more severe degree of brain damage. Seizures are not the only manifestations of epilepsy. I'll show you that with the comorbidities. And that's why the recent Landmark Institute of Medicine report for its title, this is a 500-page report, has epilepsy across the spectrum. Now, what are the comorbidities of epilepsy? Depression. So we are used to thinking, I just was diagnosed to epilepsy, uh, for, uh, uh, with epilepsy I cannot drive in my state. Fortunately, it is only for three months if I can prove that I can control my seizures for three months. But that can trigger depression in me. That means to say, my wife has to take me to work all the time. I can no longer drive to see our son in Wisconsin and things like that. But that's not the picture. We have found out that in some patients, not in all, depression precedes epilepsy. People with major depression, have a six times, six times higher risk of developing a first seizure than people without major depression. In fact, if you look at people with seizures, you'll find out even before they had their first seizure, they had a two to three times higher risk of a suicidal attempt even before the first seizure occurred than other people. So we know that depression is not only a consequence, it is something that could be a precursor, if not a cause, we don't know yet. But it can occur side by side. That's what we mean by comorbidity. So there are other things that is a comorbid condition to seizures. People who have brain tumors then develop seizures and epilepsy, their lifespan may be affected by the type of brain tumor they have. Persons with uncontrolled seizures, especially grandma seizures at nighttime when they are sleeping, 
Well, they are at high risk of SUDEP, sudden unexplained death in epilepsy. And you and I know that we have negative impact of seizures and epilepsy diagnosis. Driving is one consequence. In some persons, learning may be affected, thinking, memory, by medications, or by the seizure episodes, or both. We all know that people with epilepsy have a harder time finding a job. We also know that often their insurance coverage is denied, whether it's for health insurance or for life insurance. And as we have seen, the impact on women of childbearing age is different than in other populations. Now, I would like to say something positive about the challenges in epilepsy, because I don't want you to leave uh, my talk thinking that uh, we have problems with epilepsy. It's the worst condition we'll have. I think the first step in trying to eradicate epilepsy is to recognize what it is and what challenges it poses. The organization I represent, the American Epilepsy Society, is a sister organization of Epilepsy Foundation for many, many decades. We are an organization of professionals, researchers. Our mission doesn't say that we want to get more money so we can do research. Yes, we need more money. Our mission is we want to eradicate epilepsy. I want to tell you that I'm reading a book called The Second Machine Age. Second Machine Age. It's written by two MIT professors. And I think we are at the golden age of scientific advancement because of the digital revolution and the currently developing artificial intelligence revolution. Things are going to develop and evolve very fast. I personally cannot promise you we'll have eradication of epilepsy within a number of years, but I think this is an exciting time. Thank you very much. I took a shortcut. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. So. Your leadership and your friendship is greatly appreciated and highly treasured. And I look forward to our ongoing partnership. And as a community partner, I do want to say that in addition to the American Epilepsy Society, who is such a strong partner of the Epilepsy Foundation, we're very fortunate to be building a community of partners. Uh, there are leaders in epilepsy in our community who are doing great work every day for people living with epilepsy, and some of them are here with us at this conference, and I would like to recognize them at this time. Uh, Christina San Insenzio leads the LGS Foundation, and thank you, Christina, for being here and for your work. We really appreciate you. <laughs> Lisa Moss and Kari Rosbeck represent the TS Alliance, uh, the Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance, and Lisa, thank you so much for your leadership and support. <laughs> the Danny Did Foundation is here as well, represented out in the lobby, and Tom Stanton is their leader. He is a, a great friend and leader, and Tom, thank you for your support as well, and for your leadership. The Charlie Foundation is here with us as well today, and Jim Abrams and Beth Zupank are right here. And uh, Jim, Beth, thank you so much for all you do. We appreciate you. And the Dravet Syndrome Foundation is here as well, represented out in the lobby. And Lori O'Driscoll, thank you so much for your leadership and the community that you serve. Thank you, Lori. I have great help on my team, great leadership on my team. That was Dr. Jan Bulow, who leads our programs and research. I want to thank Barbara Croner from the Accardi Foundation. Barbara, thank you so much for your leadership in helping driving research and community. Thank you, Barbara. And um, Paige Figgy 
and Realm of Caring are here with us as well in this conference. Paige, thank you so much for all you're doing and your leadership and advocacy. Thank you very much, Paige. And we do have a, a community partner, in a sense, uh, from Minnesota who is also a performer and has been a great friend to me and to the foundation. Uh, his name is Billy McLaughlin. He's a, a world-famous guitarist who has a son with epilepsy. And Billy, I want to thank you for your leadership and your advocacy and for being here as well. Thank you. There are others, and I will introduce more later, but I wanted to take just a moment and introduce our next speaker. Um, Trish Barnes is a friend who has a very special story to share. And uh, through that story, uh, people's lives will not only be touched, but I believe will be saved. And I just want to say that Trish... You are a great advocate, a great leader, a great mind and heart, and a great spirit. And on top of all that, you're a great friend. So I welcome you to the stage. If you'd help me welcome Trish Barnes. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you today and to share my story and an honor to be invited to speak at the Pipeline Conference Family Day. San Francisco is actually where I started my family almost 33 years ago with the birth of my son Alfred in 1981. So for me, this is a homecoming to a city I dearly love. Thanks so much to Kim Mocker and Patty Schaefer for including me in this most special day. I'm here to tell you about Kevin, my second son, who came along in 1984. He was a normal, healthy child, happy, loving, precocious. One day, though, when he was 10, I found him in the midst of a grand mal seizure, and this was the beginning of a long and difficult journey with epilepsy. Over the coming several years, I lost count of the number of medications we tried and the different combinations. Each time one proved ineffective, we experienced the crushing disappointment, the long road backward to get off the drug before the attempt to add a new drug or a new combination. No matter what we tried, the seizures were unrelenting. In desperation, we finally opted for surgery. It too was unsuccessful and Kevin's seizures actually got worse. Additionally, he was left with a deficit, which caused him to hypersalivate continuously, which became extremely problematic while he was sleeping. By this time, he no longer even attempted to attend school on a regular basis. Excuse me. As a self-employed single mother, our small family faced incredible emotional and financial stress, which only added to the surreal quality of our experience and our existence at that time. We ended up less than a year after the initial surgery at the Montreal Neurological Institute, where a second surgery proved successful. <clears throat> to our incredible relief and joy, Kevin became almost magically well. In one wonderful year, he grew a foot and, drew, and, and took great delight on looking down at me and calling me short stuff. <laughs> it seemed his life was back on track, seizure-free for months on end, building toward that goal of seizure freedom, with the ultimate goal, of course, being a driver's license so he could date. <laughs> life seemed normal, peaceful, and happy, so much more, so much so that I was seduced by the relief from stress and worry and I was not vigilant enough. I believed what I could see and what I wanted to see. One beautiful warm summer day, as Kev asked enthusiastically if we could join our friends at the swimming pond, his seizure disorder wasn't even on my mind. I believed he was well. He had been, to my knowledge, seizure-free for 18 months. Kevin drowned that day. I used to be haunted by memories of every second of that final day. But I have, 
through grace, found a new life, and I have been able finally to forgive myself, but I cannot forget. I was asked to speak today about how epilepsy affects the family. Of course, I know that all of you here could tell us any number of ways that your lives have changed, all of them inconvenient, difficult, frustrating, and so often frightening. As I thought back on our lives during Kevin's illness, what came mostly to my mind was an image of absolute and unre unrelenting stress, anxiety, worry, fear, exhaustion. How can we possibly gauge the effect this has on an individual, not to mention the family? The random chaos of seizures do dominated our lives, and the ferocious quality of epilepsy was paralyzing. Kevin's epilepsy and his passing changed my life forever. His death has had more impact on my life than any other single event. It is now coming on 13 years since he left his body, and there's not a day I do not think of him, wonder what he's doing and how he is. I miss him still in innumerable ways. The early months after Kevin passed are sort of blank for me, as if I lived in a cold, gray fog bank. With a child's death, the future dies as well, and it is difficult to find reasons to continue. But of course, I could not leave Alfred, who has Asperger's syndrome, and now he needed me even more than Kevin. A break in the fog occurred one morning when I awoke with a conviction that I was to begin working with stained glass. I acted on the conviction immediately and began. I spent endless hours with glass, being in the quiet, still flow of creation, without thought, beautiful windows were being brought into being. I learned that creating in silence brought peace and comfort to me, and eventually healing began. I still create in glass. Because of the space, <clears throat> because in that space I am surrounded and infused by God's peace, it is now an absolute necessity in my life. It is in that space that I am connected to Kevin still. Eventually, the first pyramid was created, and over the coming 10 years, a collection of 20 was built. A book emerged as well. Both the book and the pyramids were donated to the Epilepsy Therapy Project. My goal for the pyramids, since I first realized I was making a collection, was $1 million, <clears throat> with each pyramid generating a donation of $50,000 to be held in trust creating an annual gift in perpetuity for the development of epilepsy therapies and research. I could not be more delighted than I am to tell you that this dream is becoming a reality with the first pyramid sponsored in December by the incredibly generous gift of Bob and Terry Smith. I I thank them with all my heart and I thank them on behalf of each of you, because ultimately, all of you will be the beneficiaries of their generosity. As Kim and I brainstormed about how to introduce Kevin's pyramids, this is so weird, could you take this? <laughs> As I considered, um, let's see, um, we, we do, anyway, we developed the idea of a pyramid campaign. One thing that became evident, though, upon reflection, was that we were one pyramid short. If you can imagine a pyramid and then build one with blocks, there would be like six on the bottom, then five, then four, then three, then two, and if you counted that up, that's 20. So we were missing the capstone. <clears throat> so I have now begun work on the 21st pyramid. As I considered the theme of this last pyramid, I thought about how focused we tend to be on the pure awfulness of epilepsy and how cruelly it defines the lives of people. But that's not what I want to remember. What I think about now is the beautiful smile Kevin always shared with everyone he came into contact with. I think about him laughing and joking and his exuberance and loving embrace of life. Out of this came the name for the last pyramid. It will be called Joyful Remembrance. It is a comet flying through a purple night sky, free, exuberant, and joyous, just like my Kevin. My intention is to inscribe the names of those we have lost to epilepsy and epilepsy-related conditions and accidents onto the pieces of the pyramid. 
I intend to present the pyramid to the Epilepsy Foundation at the gala in December this year. So today I'm issuing a call to all of you to help me in this creative effort by sending along to me the names of those you have lost. Please include their age, a picture, a paragraph, and a thought about what you remember and love most about them. Feel free to pass along this request to anyone you know who would like to have their names and the, their loved one included in the pyramid. As I inscribe their names, I will be thinking of them and reaching out to them in remembrance of the joyful, loving times they brought into this world. I need to have a final list by uh, early November so that I can finish the pyramid for December. So please send your information to me at trish at kevinspyramids.com. Um, the website is almost up. You just need to give me a, two more days or so. Um, but you can still give me emails. Those work. I just need to do a little bit more, but it's almost finished. And um, I did put a, just I showed a picture of my, or I put my book right there so that you would know. And of course, all the profits from the book will go to the Epilepsy Foundation. And um, if you'd like to see a copy of, of the book and find out how to order it, you can go to the website. And also, you'll be able to see all of the pyramids there. Kevin and I thank you for listening to our story today. Thank you. Thank you, Trish, for that powerful story. Your life is, a, it is an example and an inspiration to all of us. Thank you. We are going to move forward. We are going to accelerate. And we're going to make sure that we are able to steward all 21 of those pyramids. And I thank Bob and Terry for their leadership, and we will continue until all of those pyramids are funded. And we will continue to drive forward new therapies as a result of that. So thank you, Trish. And I have the pleasure of introducing another person who has an experience with epilepsy. And I had the privilege of meeting Christina Bertoldi this morning for the first time. I've known about Christina, and meeting her just confirmed everything I had heard. Um, she has exceeded my expectations upon meeting her, <laughs> along with her parents. And Christina, if I can ask you to come to the stage, uh, you're going to hear another story of someone's experience living with epilepsy. Please help me welcome Christina to the podium. Um, I'm Christina. I have been living with epilepsy since I was 12, and I'm 22 now. Um, I was diagnosed when my parents found me one morning with the not waking up, and I got taken to the hospital. Um, took a while to get diagnosed, and I ended up getting misdiagnosed with neurosister psychosis. I was told that there is nothing we can do besides seizure pills. I had to learn how to live differently with how to adjust to having a seizure disorder and having to, that I should be lucky that I was only getting them every so often and not getting them every day. So I went through high school with my seizure disorder, just going through everyday life, randomly having seizures. And once I turned 18, I moved from pediatric neurology to adult neurology, where at my first appointment, my doctor asked me, my mom and I, why we thought I had neurosister psychosis. And my mom's response was, because we were told so. 
He looked at my mom and looked at me and said, no, you're wrong. You actually have a brain tumor. And then I had to have surgery right away. So I went through my first semester, my first school year in college with knowing that once I'm out, I had to have brain surgery. Once I went and had my surgery, I first had a grid put on my brain to map my brain out. It turns out I was having 20 to 30 seizures a day without knowing. So once that came about, I was ha they were about like two minutes long, and I wouldn't even know. I was sitting there talking with my friends, not even knowing. And so once they figured that out, they're like, okay, we need to have your surgery now to remove it. So they removed my tumor. It turned out I had a gangular glioma tumor, which is a really rare tumor that only two people can diagnose in the country. So that's kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> I'm special. <laughs> um, <laughs> I forgot what it was. So uh, that was four years ago. I um, been had one breakthrough seizure a couple months after my surgery. Now I'm 22, graduated college with a psychology degree, and I have not had one seizure yet since. So now I'm four years seizure free. So. Thank you, Christina. And now I am going to ask Patty Schaefer to come to the podium to introduce uh, the next part of our presentation. And then after that, we'll take a short break. So Patty, thank you for taking the next step in our program. Okay, okay so now we hear the challenges from, you know, from a physician perspective, give us a, a good overview, and, and then from the real personal perspective of, of making this uh, real for all of us. Right? So at this point, actually, Brian, could I have uh, Mr. Lamert's slides first? I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Warren Lamert up to the stage. He's going to be talking with us about the epilepsy pipeline. He is uh, Chair of the Epilepsy Foundation, uh, founder of, uh, co founder of Epilepsy Therapy Project and epilepsy.com, and a dear friend. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, good morning. Thank you, Patty, and I want to say thank you to Ken Macher, too, and to our entire Epilepsy Therapy Project, Epilepsy Foundation team for the great work they've done in organizing and hosting the conference. And those are remarkable talks that I'm following. Um, so thank you for sharing those incredible experiences. Um, you know, as you know, and you've heard from Allison, you know, one third of people with epilepsy live with uncontrolled seizure. Probably 50% um, have unacceptable side effects that impact thinking, memory, cause fatigue, sleepiness, have impacts on coordination. And SUDEP and mortality in epilepsy are major facts of seizures in epilepsy that still get too little discussion. Um, I'm here both as the chairman of the Epilepsy Foundation, but also as the father of a 17-year-old girl, Sylvie, whose journey with epilepsy began at nine months with two seizures out of the blue one afternoon that was followed by an episode of status and a journey through every available drug on the market for epilepsy, um, an implanted medical device. We've tried the ketogenic therapy. And um, you know, it's been a life of seizures despite all available therapies. Recently, we've been fortunate to try a new medication, which for the last 16 weeks has provided remarkable control over tonic-clonic seizures at least. So it shows the promise and potential of the pipeline that you're about to hear about. Um, So the pipeline, what is it? Really, it's all forms of new therapies. 
It's drugs, it's devices, diagnostics, dietary, and alternative therapies. You know, the objective, the end goal is eliminating seizures and side effects and SUDEP and mortality and epilepsy. These individual therapies that you'll hear about, though, are really the steps along this journey to a cure. Cures don't come whole baked. Um, so this goal of advancing new therapies for people with epilepsy in a time frame that matters is the mission of the Epilepsy Therapy Project of the Epilepsy Foundation. And we really you know, um, have had a remarkable two-day conference that's led into the family conference, which is our annual review of the epilepsy pipeline with presentations by many of the researchers and innovators who are developing these therapies. And I really am excited about what the future can bring us as a community through this pipeline. And you know, the central message I would have of this talk is both the hope that exists in that pipeline and a plea for the community to recognize that the pipeline is our future, our chance to really change what seizures and epilepsy mean and ultimately to move towards a cure and that it's a, a process that requires support from the community in terms of participation and research but also financial support to move things forward. Um, so with that we will look forward into the pipeline. We present a view of the pipeline on epilepsy.com, epilepsy.com slash pipeline and this is sort of what it looks like on the right side of the screen there, which is gonna be hard for you to see in short, but it's there for everyone in the community as a resource. Roger Porter works with our team to keep this up to date, and it gives you a visualization of the new therapies, their sponsors, where they are in their development, what kind of therapy they are, are they drugs, devices, therapies, and provides links to more information about each therapy too. There are today about 123 projects in the pipeline. 19 of those have sort of fallen by the wayside, are dormant for the moment. Um, and the Epilepsy Foundation and the Epilepsy Therapy Project, as you heard earlier, have over the last decade played a significant role in providing funding you know, generally seed funding and a very small share of the dollars that go into advancing these new therapies, but nevertheless important to getting them off the ground and in motion as projects to, to 60 of these 123 new therapies. Um, and it really is very diverse in terms of the approaches that are being taken with everything from genetic therapy to drugs and advances in dietary therapy um, and detection and prediction part of this pipeline. So four therapies for which the Epilepsy Therapy Project and Epilepsy Foundation have provided key funding have actually emerged from the pipeline and are out helping people with epilepsy. These are really home runs for us as an organization and for our community. Um, the first I'll mention is the Visual Aids MR guided laser for doing epilepsy surgery. And this um, new approach to surgery means that for many people where they can reach the area that, that needs to be ablated, um, instead of doing a complete craniotomy, and removing you know, significant golf ball sized tissue, you can do a small burr hole in the side of the head, put a laser through, and um, take out the tissue that's causing the seizures, and people can go home the same day or the next day. It, it probably is now somewhere over 10% of the epilepsy surgeries that are being done, and this is a profound change. Um, our former ETP president, uh, Joyce Kramer, deserves credit for this. She found visual aids at a 
um, meeting she attended in Houston, talked them into the idea of trying this in epilepsy and said, we'll fund it. And we funded sort of a proof of principle in epilepsy, which worked. And they were able to get more venture funding to really ramp up and commercialize and market. And it's become a great success. The smartwatch by Smart Monitor, I think they're here today with a booth. Um, Bob Fisher, who's here today, has been the scientific leader of this project. But it's a device that can detect um, tonic-clonic seizures, the seizures that have significant motion. It has an accelerometer in it. And on detecting a seizure, it can send a GPS coordinate to caregivers, initiate a phone call, um, and alert and most recently can track your seizures and enter them right into our My Epilepsy Diary. Um, so there's a lot of good innovation going on in this area, but this is an important product that's available now and can give greater comfort of mind to caregivers and, and dependents, we think, for people with epilepsy. Um, our first Shark Tank winner two years ago is the SAMI system, which is an infrared camera developed by Charles and Cynthia Anderson that can detect abnormal motion at night, record that, and notify a caregiver. They have a table outside. We're in the middle of an Indiegogo campaign to give them funds to further develop this system. But I think it's a wonderful tool as somebody who's still not sure whether my daughter is having seizures at night. I, I need to get this actually working for us, um, but think it could be very helpful to many families. Finally, we have the Monarch E TNS system from NeuroSigma. This is a trigeminal nerve stimulator that it's an external device, so they can basically do it just above the forehead. And the promise here is partly that it has, you know, some promising early data, it needs further clinical study to really show efficacy. Um, it is available now in Europe, which has a regulatory regime which looks first at safety and then at efficacy, and so allows products, especially on the device side, to get to market much faster than in the U.S., where we require um, really convincing, thorough, expensive, time-taking uh, trials to prove efficacy. We ultimately need that data, and so we'll need more data from NeuroSigma. But this is a very promising device that could be very complementary to what we're doing with vagus nerve stimulation, and um, you know maybe get a sense of whether that could work for you before you have to have a device implanted. So these are some of the newer therapies that have emerged from the pipeline, and I'm going to run through this pretty quickly. But there are three new drugs that have come to market in the last 12 months, which is pretty remarkable. One has a new mechanism, mechanism of action. The others are new formulations, some of which, though, have data which really suggest they changed the efficacy of these drugs with these formulations. So it's, it's really exciting and an unusual year to have had four new products come to market in epilepsy. On the device side, we really got the second major new device after a 16-year journey from conception and funding to being available to patients in the Neuropace Responsive Neurostimulator System. This is a device which can detect a seizure and then use electrical stimulation to try to disrupt and abort a seizure. Um, a device that should have been available probably even earlier to patients in the U.S., but is now available to patients in Canada and Europe is the Medtronic Aptiva Deep Brain Stimulator, which um, Bob Fisher's played a key role in developing, but it provides deep thalamic stimulation on a regular pulse basis that has very strong efficacy as well. You know, we've spoken about visual A's and NeuroSigma. On the diagnostic side, I think these developments ultimately over the next five and ten years are truly going to revolutionize epilepsy therapy, and it's the source of my greatest excitement. I mean, I think the diverse aspect of the pipeline 
is another reason for excitement. And I'm sure there'll be things that none of us can imagine that will actually be more important than the things that I can get excited about today looking out five to 10 years. But already the new gene panels from companies like GeneDx, Cortigen, and Athena Quest Diagnostics can provide tremendous value in both diagnosing genetic epilepsies, but also in beginning to guide therapy and helping physicians and families think about which of the many epilepsy drugs that are available are appropriate for their epilepsy. There's a lot more coming in this space. Um, you know, I'm involved with a company called Intellimedics as well, which may make contributions in this area. Seizure detection and alert, again, will not only help caregivers realize that a loved one is having a seizure and give some independence to people with epilepsy, um, but the ability to get automated seizure diaries where we get objective data so that we actually have some sense of what drugs are working and when you change doses, you change therapies, quickly getting that data back to doctors and, 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 um, and informing the patients themselves. I know how hard it is to try to keep a seizure diary as dedicated as I am to you know, my daughter's care and, and helping Sylvie. It's very, very difficult to keep a paper seizure diary. And um, there's just a whole array of new technologies making it possible to sort of automatically track seizures and get them uploaded into a database. Um, you know, Smart Monitor and High Pass are the, are the first. Um, what is coming in the pipeline? Um, this is a look sort of at some of the things that I think are near. GW Pharma is doing trials of CBD, their Epidiolex product. Sylvie is now on that in a trial out of New York University. The Epilepsy Foundation helped support that first trial. And you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm really appreciative to GW Pharma for their 15 years of work on looking at the medicinal potential of medical marijuana and for doing the trials necessary to determine if it'll be effective. Um, you know, I think they have just gotten fast-track designation maybe yesterday in Dravet, and I'm hopeful they could begin to do a larger efficacy trial even by the end of this year. Medical marijuana is now a reality in many states. Charlotte's Web, um, you know, and Paige Figgy in the Circle of Care, and the Stanley Brothers have been key players in Colorado who are also working to do a clinical trial to help show the efficacy of that product. There's a lot of anecdotal enthusiasm for it. We'll need clinical trials you know, to really know. Uh, it does seem to be helping, you know, that Sylvie's on the GW Pharma product, does seem to be help, helping my daughter now, but you can't know until we really have a clinical trial. Um, Cyberonics in the device world is working on several products which are fairly advanced. A responsive vagus nerve stimulator, which um, stimulates in response to accelerated heart rate. And they also are working on a nighttime seizure detector called ProGuardian Rest, which is exciting. The not so far includes a number of new pharmaceuticals, in Ciro, Huperzine A for Drave. There's another product that's been used in Europe for Drave, which seems to have real promise and has you know, had the experience in people, could get to market relatively quickly. In a short amount of time, Sage Pharmaceuticals has gone a long way in developing a new GABA-based drug um, for people who are in status epilepticus with remarkable results in just four patients but um, that's a project which feels like it could get to market in a, a relatively short amount of time. UCB has a follow-on drug, Riveracetam, that um, is in late phase three trials um, and could be another important compound available for us. On the seizure detection side, uh, we've provided support for work um, 
for the development of a new seizure detector that might be able to detect not just tonic-clonic seizures, but also partial seizures if um, the, the results bear out using um, autonomic system information. Um, there's another seizure detector based on EMG that's well under development, and transcranial magnetic stimulation is being used already on a research basis. It's been approved for depression. Two companies have products on the market and has real promise in epilepsy. And the far but visible Asclepios uh, has a project in doing gene therapy for epilepsy, which we help fund. There are other companies working with technologies that could be valuable to a variety of genetic disorders, including Dravet and other epilepsies. Cell therapies uh, have shown value in animal trials, and um, companies are working hard to get those into human trials, and it has real, real promise, where you can take an individual's skin cells, grow them into neurons, sometimes correct whatever genetic defect they have, and then grow up a population and re-inject them. It's kind of science fiction type stuff, but it, it, it seems to be working. Um, again, personalized medicine informed by genetics and biomarkers is something I'm enormously excited about. And the device world is going to bring a lot more, including closed loop devices and device drug hybrids. Alternative therapies um, are another key area of investment and hope for the community. Um, you know, dietary therapies, we've had a wonderful champion in the Charlie Foundation and Jim Abrams. These alternative therapies lack commercial agents who have economic incentives to get out and evangelize and educate patients and doctors. So this is an area where the Epilepsy Foundation and the community has to play a greater role in sponsoring research and um, showing their value and educating. And from that um, recognition, you know, I'm thrilled to say that Phil Gatone, in our plan for 2014, has proposed creating an Epilepsy Foundation Wellness Institute, which will try to drive research and education around alternative therapies, including dietary therapies, health and wellness, exercise, stress, and mood. Um, I, I think it's enormously promising and important. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. You'll hear more later. Um, but there is a lot of good work that's been done on dietary therapies as alternatives and complements to other therapeutic options. And again, um, we're lucky to have a hero among us and Jim Abrams for his advocacy in this respect. Um, health and wellness, you know, exercise, stress and wellness, you know, it's been recognized as important throughout the history of epilepsy, but it's still underutilized. We also need more good studies to show how it fits into treatment as serious treatments in the way that we've begun to do with dietary therapy, but there's a lot of data suggesting that exercise has huge impacts on seizures. And, um, you know, it's obvious that the goal of all of this therapy and everything we're doing is wellness and better lives. Obviously, many of these therapies not only can have an impact on seizures, but they speak to the higher goal of wellness and good lives. So there's a lot going on in diagnostic and seizure detection devices um, with a real need for biomarkers that help show whether someone has epilepsy, is it getting better, is it getting worse, um, and there's interesting work going on there. I think we've talked about some of these opportunities with seizure detection devices, the ability to marry, marry that to cloud databases, bring that together with genomics, and you know, I think that will help in terms of finding new biomarkers, uh, advancing new ideas about possible therapies, and informing sort of personal genomics. Medical marijuana, 
Again, we need randomized controlled trials, but there actually is a long history of use of medical marijuana in epilepsy. There are positive, positive anecdotal reports of use by patients, um, and there are numerous, numerous animal studies of both CBD and THC suggesting efficacy in epilepsy. Um, so EF has come out very strongly across the country on behalf of support for research and unimpeded research into medical marijuana and access um, for parents. We have you know, now more than 100 families, I understand, that have moved to Colorado to gain access to medical marijuana. And you know, we think that is just fundamentally wrong that people living in one state have a right and access to try medical marijuana, um, and others, because of their zip code, do not. Um, it's a frustrating, difficult situation that we hope to help without having the strong kind of clinical data we'd like to have to support use and with issues, especially for the artisanal growers, about knowing what you're getting. <laughs> You'll hear more about that later today. There's been a remarkable role of the community, you know, in the development of medical marijuana. Two years ago, there was an individual, Jason David, who was at this conference talking about his son's success with medical marijuana. People looked at him a little bit wild-eyed. Fortunately, Catherine Jacobson listened to him, went to do more work and bring together the data that we had from use um, by a small group of parents of medical marijuana. And um, with Evelyn Nussbaum, Orrin Davinsky and others, um, you know, we're fortunate to gain the year of GW Pharma and um, really kick off an amazing movement. So it just shows the incredible power a few parents in our community can have, um, you know, working with industry and, and moving new therapy options forward. You know, you'll hear more about these issues, and I've spoken to them already to a certain degree uh, with medical marijuana. So our community and the Epilepsy Therapy Project of the Epilepsy Foundation really can be and has been a key driver of this pipeline of new options for patients and families. And um, I just can't emphasize how your involvement in research, you know, participating in clinical trials and supporting our foundation and other advocacy groups um, you know, can be so important to creating better lives and better futures. So ask everyone to take charge and join with us and let's um, move to end epilepsy, seizures, and SUDEP. Thank you. Okay, so uh, well, we're not going to a break. We need to go to Dr. Porter's slides. Here we go. Okay. This is my shortness. I mean. So Dr. Roger Porter is uh, Chief Scientific Officer of Epilepsy Foundation and much, much more in his bio. He's going to be here talking to us, just a, a brief overview of kind of the new drugs and kind of how to make one so we understand what the process behind it is. Before, right after a break, we're going to really be talking about, you know, where are some of the new things that are out there. So um, I know we're a little bit off kilter on the break, but we're going to make up that time to make sure you hear from everybody. Dr. Porter. Thank you very much, Patty. <clears throat> and congratulations on a terrific job of organizing this. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to follow uh, Warren Lambert's incredible overview of what's, uh, what's out there. Uh, and really, I'm a kind of a bit of a prelude to, to Dr. French right after the break. Uh, she's going to tell you what's actually coming down in, in detail in new drugs. And my job is relatively simple. I'm just going to tell you about how we make them, okay? Um, and some of you know the, some of this, um, and so I apologize in advance. Uh, but some of you may not know all of these little details. And so we're going to quickly go through this. 
First thing I want to do is clear up a kind of mystery that may be uh, bothering you sometimes when you hear the word anti-seizure drugs and anti-epileptic drugs. Okay, if you think about seizures, those are the symptoms, and the epilepsies, you heard Elson so talk about whether they're diseases or, or, or disorders and so forth, um, but we know that patients with epilepsy have seizures. That's very straightforward. Well, drugs that we use for epilepsy are really anti-seizure drugs. They're not really drugs that are, are fundamentally against the, the inner process of how epilepsy actually occurs. So they're not really anti-epileptic drugs. Now, the big textbooks use the term anti-epileptic drugs, uh, but I just want you to understand that we're really treating drugs, uh, using drugs as symptomatic therapies, okay? We, we don't really have very much evidence that these drugs have a long-term effect on epilepsy. But there are anecdotal reports, of course, but in general, we think of them as symptomatic therapies. So anti-seizure drugs is the, u is the term that really we should be using. So how do we find them? I'm going to talk about how we find them, and then I'm going to talk about how we develop them. By that, mean, I mean how we get them to the, to the registration and to the patient, okay? So let's jump back for a second. Um, I'm getting pretty old, actually. Um, and uh, I was a resident um, in this city. Um, I think I'm in San Francisco. Um, I was a resident in this city from 71 to 74, okay? And at th that time, the first four drugs, plus some benzodiazepines, were all we had for epilepsy. It's hard to believe. I started using Tegretol or carbamazepine, um, and the chief of the service said, well, this was like 1972, I was using it off-label as you were, and he says, do you know what you're doing? Huh? Do you, do, you, do you really know that this carbamazepine, this Tegretol, is really good for seizures? Well, it was approved uh, just about the time I, I left my residency. But it's amazing, and you're going to see another picture of how far we have come uh, since I was just finishing my residency in neurology. So how do we find these drugs? Well, basically, there are the three possible ways. We can be lucky, okay? We can discover it uh, just by accident. And that's true for several drugs. It's true for, it's true for phenobarbital. It's true for valproic acid. Um, sometimes we just, you just sort of stumble over it, okay? Screening. That's where we're really good, and I'm going to come and describe that in more detail. Because we, in the CNS, the central nervous system world, okay, epilepsy has an advantage in that we have relatively predictive animal models. And this is why we've had so much success in finding new drugs. The, far, the, the, the last is rational development. How... how can we figure out how the brain neurotransmitters work and use that to develop a new drug? An example would be Vigabatrin, which, which it, it inhibits the degradation of GABA, which is an, uh, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, okay? So it stops the seizure in that way. Now, unfortunately, rational development hasn't been as successful as we'd like, okay? Tiagabine is another example. It, it's, it's, it hasn't been nearly as successful as screening. Now, how do we screen? Well, the, the NIH, specifically the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, big mouthful, NINDS, okay, has since 1975 supported the anticonvulsant screening program. This was started in 75 by three people who are listed here. Um, I actually happened to be on the spot as a kind of a fellow at that time. Um, and, and watched it all happen. Um, and the contract from NINDS is to screen compounds, and they're accepted from all sources, academia and industry, even, they even come from abroad, and more, to, more than 30,000 compounds have been screened um, in these animal models at the University of Utah. Uh, it's currently run by Dr. Steve White, who just got the Accelerator Award, well-deserved, uh, just uh, at the, in the last day or two. So this is an old slide that's actually not even exactly accurate anymore um, uh, of how this, the, the, the 
the plan of how a, a, a drug comes in, it gets identified, it goes through certain tests, and if it doesn't make it in those tests, um, it's dropped, but if it makes it in one of those tests, it moves on and gets, uh, uh, it gets more quantified in ter terms to see if it, if it really is, is a drug, uh, and then differentiate it if, it if you can, and then they can do advanced studies, okay? So the whole process um, is one of, of an iterative process, and a drug can fall out of, out of out of the process at any time, and most do, of course. Uh, we don't we don't success success rate is not expected to be very high. Um, but these, since 1990, these are the drugs that have come through, almost all from screening, okay? Um, not all of these came from the ASP, but almost all of them came from one kind of screening process or another, even if, even if, if not the ASP, uh, then in industry. So now how do we develop them? After we get them, how do we develop them? Um, how do we take a drug that we find in the laboratory um, and say, okay, how do, we, how, do, how do we get it into the patient? Well, the first thing you have to do, unfortunately, um, is you have to do about a million and a half dollars worth of preclinical formulation and tox studies, okay? And that expense um, is called the valley of death, okay? Because a lot of companies can send their compounds to, or even academicians can send their compounds to Utah, which does that for nothing, by the, not for nothing. We pay for it as taxpayers, but it's free to the individual who sends it. Um, uh, but after that, then we have a problem, and, and, we, and we actually have a problem right now in that, uh, and if you've got a spare million and a half, please come see me afterwards. I'll be in the back, <laughs> okay? So what do we really want? We want an ideal product, okay? We want a, a, a drug that's a, that works for people who have refractory epilepsy. Now, I have to tell you, we don't have very good methods for finding drugs that work for refractory epilepsy. If we did, obviously, we'd be using them. We're trying to develop them. A lot of energy is going into that. Obviously, we want minimal, minimal adverse effects. Once daily dosing would be marvelous. Twice a day would be actually okay. Um, we don't want it to act, interact with other drugs. We don't want to have to titrate the drug up so that it takes a month to get up to it. I mean, these are all of this is these are the ideal things. And we'd like to have a logical mechanism of action, but we often don't find usually don't find that out uh, until after the drug is actually in clinical trials, uh, interestingly enough, in this particular disorder. This is the product flow, okay? So um, where we hang up is the so-called blue bar there, the IND track. That's, that's where we need a, that's where I need that money that you're going to give me after, 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 after my talk, okay? Um, then we go into phase one, which is typically human volunteers just to do pharmacokinetics and things. We don't really learn much about the efficacy, if anything, uh, for, for epilepsy. There are drugs where you can learn something about efficacy in phase one, but it unfortunately it doesn't happen for Then we phase two is really proof of concept, okay? Phase three is the big studies that give you a broader view, especially of safety, and then finally you get to an NDA, a new drug application, uh, and, and hope that the FDA won't take forever uh, reviewing it. And, and in general, they're not too bad. The real problem is there's no really good shortcut. Um, that re pr pr provides reliable preliminary efficacy. I'm sure Dr. French is going to talk to you about some, uh, some novel ideas on this front, um, but um, so far, a, an expensive randomized controlled trial is unfortunately the only way to ascertain whether a drug is efficacious. And I wish I had more time to expand on that. Uh, but just think about the bias. You don't understand what bias is. I mean, it's a kind of a mental leaning, uh, and everybody wants the drug to work. Okay, if you think about all of the bias in, in looking at a drug, okay, how many people want the drug to work? Well, everybody, the patient, the patient's parents, the EEG tech, the doctor, the pharmaceutical company, everybody wants it to work. So if you just hand out a drug, the probability is, oh, it's gonna work because everybody wants it to work and that's unfortunately uh, why we have to blind studies and, and so, so that we won't be affected by our own uh, intuition. I'm going to skip this because um, I don't really have time to go into it, but I just want to mention that um, 
Th these are some of the drugs that we have that are ready uh, to, to, to get that million and a half bucks um, that I need from you. Uh, and, and, and we have even more of them, okay? And these were discussed in detail in the last two days. Uh, and some of these are really exciting drugs. Um, and I'm working very hard uh, with the Epilepsy Foundation, which, which is a terrific team, and I'm pleased to be uh, honored to be part of it, to try to help find uh, funds so we can get some of these drugs moving. And there is clinical stage drugs, and I won't spend any time on that because uh, Dr. French is, I think, gonna, gonna emphasize this issue. Um, so the bottom line is, and you've heard it from Warren, you're gonna hear it from Jackie, uh, Dr. Jackie French, uh, new drugs are coming. It's a complex process. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of money. Um, we can't stop. We have to continue our iterative step-by-step uh, -step process of trying to find new drugs because each one of those new drugs helps us in a, in a big way uh, to, to get seizure control um, uh, for our patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Porter.